after dogs. They were the next species to be domesticated. So we understand them very well. We've used them for thousands of years. We know how to breed them, we know how to manage them. But when it comes to research, they're a forgotten species. We use mice for research, we use monkeys. Why don't we use sheep? So for most of my research career, I've actually used laboratory mice, and I've studied motor function, cognitive function, sleep, circadian rhythms in mice. But about 10 years ago, I decided to switch tacks and change species. This was not a decision that I took lightly, because not only did I not own any sheep, I'd never used sheep, and I, despite being a New Zealander, I didn't know very much about them. <laughs> and sheep are not used as a cognitive species. There are no cognitive tasks devised for sheep. At one level, this is the sheep's own fault, because if you take a look at sheep, you don't immediately go, hmm, that's an ideal species for modelling human cognition. <laughs> Most people think sheep are stupid and think that they're as stupid as they look. But it wasn't just an image problem that I had with thinking about using sheep. When I came to look at how to measure behaviours in sheep, I found nothing had been done on this, that there were no measures for quantifying behaviour in sheep. And if you can't quantify the outcome measures of an animal model, you can't use it for research. OK, let me wind back a bit. For the past 25 years, I've been working on a, a progressive neurological disease, Huntington's disease. This is a devastating disorder that starts with insidious motor, loss of motor control, cognitive decline, personality changes. But it progressive, progresses relentlessly, and eventually it destroys the life of the sufferer. By end stage, an, a Huntington's patient is unable to move, unable to think, unable to make decisions. And this takes a terrible toll not just on the patient, but also on their family. So, this photograph shows two people whose lives have been changed forever by Huntington's disease. On the left is my friend Charles Sabine. So Charles was a frontline war correspondent for NBC when he learned that his father had been diagnosed with Huntington's disease. His brother John, on the right, was a prominent lawyer, once described as the finest mind of his generation at Oxford. But both men, unfortunately, inherited the Huntington's disease from their father. And you can see the toll that this has taken on, on John already. This photograph was taken in 2010. John's now completely bedridden, unable to communicate, and, unable, and requires 24-hour care. Charles is not affected by the disease yet, but he will be. He carries the gene, he will get Huntington's disease. And worse for Charles is that he's seen his father's decline and he's seen his brother's decline and he knows that that is his future. So without research, there is no hope for patients with Huntington's disease and for people who carry the Huntington's disease gene. So I had three reasons for working on, on Huntington's disease. First was the development of an HD model, a large animal model of sheep. Previously, the only models available to us had been mice. The second reason was that sheep live for a long time. So they have long lives and mice only live for two years. So modelling a disease that is a late onset, adult onset disease in a mouse that only lives for two years is very limiting. Sheep don't live as long as humans, obviously, but they can easily live for 10 years. And so having this long life gives us a, a unique window of opportunity for studying, particularly the early stages of Huntington's disease. And the third reason was that sheep have large brains. This photograph shows an image of a mouse brain, a sheep brain, and a human brain. And if you can see the mouse brain at the bottom, it's obvious which of these is a better species to model the human, the sheep in the middle, obviously. It's not just the size difference, there's the anatomy is much more similar in the sheep to the human than is the mouse. So, large brain, long life, and a Huntington's disease sheep model. 
But that wasn't the end of the problem. In fact, it was just the beginning because we didn't have methods for quantifying sheep behavior. The fact that sheep were thought of as being stupid didn't bother me particularly. After all, I've worked on mice, and mice are not the most intelligent of species. But one thing that I was told is that I wouldn't be able to work with sheep alone. And if you can't work with an animal alone, you can't do behavioral testing. So human neuro neuropsychological testing and animal behavior is done with the investigator and either the person alone or just with one person. So if I couldn't work with a sheep alone, I wouldn't be able to do the sort of tests that I wanted to do. Well, thankfully, this dogma turned out not to be true. Not only a sheep Good, ex good subjects for cognitive function, and they're actually very smart, much smarter than we'd thought. They, in comparable tasks, their performance is as good as that of a monkey. But it also turned out that they were very willing to work alone as long as they were with a, an investiga investigator that they trusted. And this willingness meant that we could devise tasks for measuring cognitive function that were really relevant to Huntington's disease. I'm actually going to show you this. Rather than tell you how easy it is for sheep to um, do performances, I'm going to show you a short video. So this sheep is in an arena. She's working by herself. There is an investigator at the back, but she actually runs this experiment herself. She comes through a corridor, breaks a beam, and the two stimuli come up on the, on the screen. Now, this sheep's been taught to recognize the faces of familiar individuals, uh, Emma Watson on the right in, in this particular case. So what she does is she comes up, she looks at the faces, she makes a decision, and she indicates this decision by breaking an infrared beam that goes from the top of the screen to the bottom. She breaks it with her nose. If she gets it right, a food reward is delivered to the hopper. If she gets it wrong, there's a tone sounds and she has to start over again. So let's just run the video and you can see her doing this task herself. So she's got it right and she's eating her food. So the willingness to work like this, that you can do, so not just the face recognition task that you've seen, but other tasks of cognitive flexibility, means that we now have the tools to measure behavioral and cognitive changes in the Huntington's disease sheep. Obviously, we're not just interested in, in sheep intelligence. We want to use these models to test new therapies. And, and the prospect of being able to test and quantify changes means that we have ways of assessing um, therapeutic new, th new therapies. This gives great hope to Huntington's patients who, need, who desperately need these sort of treatments. But it's not just Huntington's patients for whom there can be new hope. There are at least 16 different sheep versions of neurological diseases. So this is, this is a list of just some of them. Most of these diseases are actually extremely rare. You might not have heard of many of them. And so you might think, well, they don't really matter that much. They only affect a few people. But you try telling that to the mother of a child who's demented because it has Bathon's disease. For every person who has one of these rare diseases, research is essential to give them hope. And we don't need to use scarce resources on a rare disease developing new mouse models of these diseases. The sheep models already exist, so we should be using sheep models to study these disorders, especially now we have ways of, of, of measuring particularly cognitive decline. And it's not just these rare genetic diseases that sheep get. Sheep get epilepsy, sheep have brain tumors, sheep get strokes, sheep, have, sheep get depressed. We could use sheep as research models for many of these diseases, which is so difficult to model in mice. So that even that doesn't have to be the end of the story. It could be just the beginning. The, the sheep models, these sheep models, were not discovered by a careful, selected um, examination of the sheep population. They were discovered serendipitously by observant farmers and scientists. What why, might we see if we actually look for new models? So Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, for example, these, these diseases are set 
to become a major problem in the next, in the next few decades as our population ages. And current mouse models are inadequate. Not only, it's not just the short life of mouse models that make them inadequate for, for modeling Alzheimer's disease, for example. The mice don't make the right pathology. So the plaques, the neurofibrillary tangles that characterize Alzheimer's disease, mice don't get them. But sheep do. You look at an old sheep and they have tangles. Not as many as you do in Alzheimer's disease, but they, they definitely have them. They also have amyloid pathology. So if we looked, perhaps we might find that out there, there's already a good large animal model of Alzheimer's disease. So what can we learn from sheep? Well, I think we're limited by our own ambition. Sheep have been the patient servant of humankind for thousands of years. And if we could abandon our prejudices about them and embrace their potential, they could have a lot more to offer us as large animal models of the human neurodegenerative diseases for which we so desperately need treatments. <laughs>